Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talk with Jordan Gross, an entrepreneur working across tech, music and healthcare, who is also an outspoken proponent of rational public health policy, which respects individual rights. I talk with Jordan about everything from public health, informed consent, Brexit and philosophical questions about freedom. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Jordan, thanks so much for coming on. Um, we connected through Twitter, as with many of my guests, and uh, I've really liked some of the takes that you've been putting out there. I just think you speak a lot of common sense, so I'm really keen to speak to you and uh, get some of your ideas on everything that's going on right now. Of course, no problem, my pleasure. So let's start with where you are, because you're in Lisbon, which is also a place that I've lived. And um, when I lived there, it seemed relatively anarchic. Um, <laughs> there was... <laughs> There was not much in the way of people abiding by laws and rules and people generally did what they wanted and it was a very, very free society. And a lot of the things which we are used to having in the West, things like um, being unable to smoke indoors, um, having to have a license to ride a scooter and things like this, they didn't seem to apply there. It seemed to be that um, things were quite free and open. It was very... Uh, libertarian in many ways. Um, but I have heard that there's quite a strong mass culture over there. So let's get your opinion on that. Um, can you just share with us like what your experience is of, uh, of Lisbon? Of course. So um, I've been here for uh, nearly 18 months now. Um, and before, and I'd visited Lisbon quite a few times before that, before coming here as well, in kind of pre-COVID times. Um, and I found it the same as you, very kind of libertarian and very free. I mean, I remember what there was one evening, <clears throat> there was a like a techno party going on next to the Time Out Market with some amazing Romanian DJs. And it was like 7 p.m. on a Thursday evening. And there were like 300 people dancing outside like lunatics. Um, so that's like a memory that's really implanted in my mind um and that is kind of the lisbon that i very much like fell in love with people being chatty and friendly and open and etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. um <clears throat> but i think that you know kind of post-covid or in the middle of covid or everything like think about it um a lot of societies have I mean, have made quite a big change in that direction. I mean, and you can just look at somewhere like Berlin, for example, which is somewhere I spent a lot of time in my 20s, um, you know, where, you know, I mean, the, the sort of rise of like techno it was very connected to this idea of kind of freedom um, and, you know, anything goes and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think that the Berlin that was certainly doesn't really exist anymore. <laughs> um, and hilariously, a lot of people, a lot of DJs and producers that were living in Berlin now live in Lisbon, which is quite, I think, which is, I think, I think pretty interesting. Um, so I think one of the things that I think that it's difficult to describe. I don't like to generalize by saying this particular country or people in a country are compliant in some kind of way. I think that's kind of a little bit unkind. Um, having said that, um, one of the things you do notice in Portugal is that people are generally quite compliant. Um, as in Portuguese, as in Portuguese people are generally quite compliant. Um, so, and you just notice that specifically with the mask wearing and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, and the best way of talking about that without getting into the like very controversial uh, mask conversation um, is that even if you think that masks might work in an indoor environment with lots of people, let's pretend for a moment that they do, um, wearing them outside has got to be approaching a level of madness, which is somewhat incomprehensible. Um, so on what you did experience here in Portugal, but also the same in Spain as well, <clears throat> is people wearing masks outside alone while walking their dog. Um, which is kind of an incomprehensible madness. Um, and it might be that that's just, that, that it's kind of became convention. So people just kind of like got used to it um, and it was just easier than taking it off, something like that. I don't really know. Um, but in, in fact, in Portugal, the, the law was always, for me, very clear um, in the sense that you only had to wear a mask outside if you were uh, less than 1.5 meters away from another person uh, and you could be with other, other household members when you're outside. <clears throat> so, I mean, Lisbon's like, you know, <clears throat> 
not packed. You know, it's not like going to Oxford Circus where, you know, it's packed. So it's very rare here that you couldn't be more than 1.5 metres away from someone. Um, so in reality, no one really had a reason here to wear masks outside. Um, yet they did quite a lot for an inexplicable reason. I, I don't know why. Interesting. Okay, so before we kind of uh, launch into some other themes, I just want to um, ask you a little bit about your history, um, both uh, on the side of business, but also with regards to how you ended up in, in Lisbon in the first place. Sure. So um, so I am an entrepreneur. I've been involved in technology companies uh, and music and the music business for uh, nearly 20 years since I was a teenager. Um, I also have another startup in healthcare that was kind of inspired by all the COVID stuff as well. Um, so my experience is kind of broad ranging. So um, I had a cloud computing company um, that I exited when I was 25. Um, I had a holiday company that failed terribly when I was 23, 24. Uh, I worked for big telecoms companies from when I was 17 to about 22. Um, and then I started a live entertainment business in London. Um, uh, and then after that, I've been involved in kind of music rights specifically um, and YouTube and social platforms um, really since then for the last three or four years. So that's kind of the breadth, that's kind of the breadth of my experience. So, um, uh, so I've been, I've built brands, I've built teams, I've built companies, I've raised money, I've sold companies, blah, 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 blah. I've done kind of the full spectrum of things so far. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been, you know, it's been fun. So what was the healthcare company? You mentioned that there was a healthcare company that you started, which was inspired by COVID. What was that? So, well, I mean, it's, we're still in the middle of, it's, it's right in the early stage at the moment. So it's called Sunny um, and it is a vitamin D coaching app with a wearable. Um, so the idea being that you've got more than a billion people around the world, uh, probably a lot more than that, that are vitamin D deficient. Um, the even what, even, even what, sorry, um, even the way that we, you know, that, um, National healthcare talks about vitamin D and sufficiency is completely wrong. The numbers are far too low. Um, and there's some very interesting things that seem to happen when you have real vitamin D sufficiency. Um, so this is the project. This is an idea that I had about a year ago in the midst of COVID. Um, and I was trying to find a way to which I could make a difference uh, with this, which was kind of like, um, which was very safe and effective, basically. I guess it's the best way of describing it. You know, it's like, it's very difficult to overdose on vitamin D, let's put it that way. You're almost starting to sound like we shouldn't just be sitting indoors with the curtains closed and wearing masks. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I think that what I often say is that we did literally the opposite of what we should have done in the last 20 months. We basically went in the opposite direction. Um, so what we should have been saying to people is, um, you know, um, we've got this, we've got this virus. We don't really know the infection fatality rate. Um, we're a bit concerned about this and blah, 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 blah. Um, so the best thing you can do is probably, you know, I, but, but we do know by this point that it disproportionately affects people that are metabolically unhealthy, um, that, 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 that are diabetic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we, fa we, you know, commiserably failed um, to give out any really useful public health messaging. Um, and obviously not helped by that is the state of our leaders. Um, I mean, you know, the amount of obese health ministers is is quite remarkable, I would say. Um, so, yeah, I think we did the opposite, basically the opposite of what we should have done. We should have been saying to people, and actually, you know, last March and April in the UK, the weather was actually beautiful. Um, so we should have been saying to people, listen, we've got this thing. We don't really know what it is yet. We're a bit worried, um, but we know that being outdoors is really safe. Um, so go for a walk, go for a cycle, walk your dog, go out with your kids, um, you know, go and be outside um, and enjoy the beautiful weather. Um, you know, and we basically didn't do that, which was, a, in my, my view, a massive failure. And why do you think that happened? Because I, I find this to be a really intriguing question that it is so obvious from anyone who looks at the data that aside from elderly people who are clearly at higher risk from COVID, yep. the other groups are people who are obese and who don't exercise or these other risk factors yeah. why is it that even in the mainstream people aren't allowed to talk about this it's like the only thing we're allowed to talk about is vaccines it almost seems as if they're lending to the conspiracy theories the fact that we're not allowed to talk about health 
I, I don't know. I mean, I think that this is really a, that it's, it's, it's a wider problem. <laughs> and, um, you know, we have a big problem in public health, right? Um, and, it, and, and, and I think a lot of that is to do with chronic disease and the, and the proportion of Western sort of health spending that's spent on chronic disease, which I think is um, upwards of 80%, might even be 85%. Um, and that is like heart disease, uh, cancer, uh, obesity, uh, metabolic health, you know, all these kind of metabolic diseases. Um, so that is kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and that is what we've been sort of very neatly ignoring for decades and decades and decades. Um, so I think that's the main problem. So we just, we just lack the right narrative and the right ways of speaking to people um, to, talk, to really talk about health and public health. Um, and in my view, that's one of the biggest failures we've had in the last 20 months. Um, you know, we've, we've gone down barking up a, you know, a bunch of trees with Big Pharma, no problem. Um, and we've ignored some of the really basic things that we could have done and we should have done um, that really would have managed to save lives. Um, you know, and that makes me think also of the kind of all the early treatment options, the people like Steve Kirsch and, you know, Pierre, um, Pierre Corey and you know, all those American frontline doctors and all those people have been talking about since the beginning. <laughs> so, you know, these, these, are, these are very eminent doctors and virologists and immunologists and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, who've been talking about cheap early treatments since the very, very beginning. Um, but, you know, th there's no, there is no good reason that I can see uh, no logical reason why we should not have been exploring cheap and effective early treatment options, um, particularly where those early treatment options are incredibly safe and very cheap, right? Um, so you can include vitamin D with that. I mean, even if it doesn't work, God, you know, you haven't, you know, there's, there's very low, the, the risk associated with vitamin D is incredibly low. Um, as um, I think David Grimes said, who's, you know, one of the, uh, say one of the world's experts on vitamin D, he, he basically sort of knows no one that's ever managed to overdose on it. And even he knew, had someone who was accidentally taking, I think, like 50,000 IUs a day. And even with that person, it took months to show any significant side effects. Um, so it's incredibly safe. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Um, so yeah, I think it's just about, for me, we've had a real failure in public health and we failed to engage people in really simple public health measures that we could have done. If it had been up to me, I would have sent everyone a bloody kettlebell and started to organize you know, yoga and Qigong classes in every park and every green space in the country. I mean, that would have been a really useful intervention rather than spending, you know, hundreds of billions on track and trace, for example. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I find interesting because I have one theory, which is that the reason that they didn't go into all of these health concerns and saying, hey, you know, we should be uh, ensuring that obesity is low. Because I don't know if you remember, there was actually a stage quite early on where there was this, um, I remember seeing this picture of Boris Johnson, he's on a bicycle and it's like, we need to get fit and stuff. And it just seemed to, it was like that we're doing this big campaign, uh, you know, but this thing seemed to last like about three days and all of a sudden it was just yeah. off the newspapers. And I was like, well, that's really odd. Like, why didn't that continue? And I don't know whether like one of my theories is that it's almost like they the media or the establishment feel like it's kind of victim blaming like if you say hey this thing affects old people it's like you know you're almost blaming people or this thing affects um people who are obese it's kind of like you're you're blaming these people who are getting ill from this thing mm. but then on the other hand you were mentioning ivermectin and it seems like we're also not allowed to talk about treatment so really that theory kind of falls down because that doesn't apply to these alternative treatments, but the same thing seems to be observed for both, which is that the only thing you're allowed to talk about is vaccines. Yeah, and I think that is a bit odd. And I think that there was a better, um, you know, whether you are into uh, COVID vaccines or, or, or not, is kind of irrelevant really, but there was certainly a much better way of having a conversation with people about these products. No one can argue that having good early treatment options, whatever disease that you may catch, is fantastic, right? Um, and the somewhere on the line, we seem to have forgotten about the overall goal, which is saving people's lives so they don't die and or, and or end up in hospital. Um, and we've got down a, a weird rabbit hole where we don't want to talk about early treatment um, we, uh, and, and indeed preventative treatment, you know, like exercise, metabolic health, vitamin D and blah, 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 blah. And, and to me, that's completely mad. And I, and I can't, I can't, you know, we look at it logically and I can't figure out why that would be the case.
Um, even if you've got the best, most effective, the safest vaccine products in the world, you would still want to talk about early treatment and preventing serious disease. I agree. I find that an impossible question. And that's one of the reasons why I think it is so easy to stray into conspiracy theories, because when you are left with no other logical explanation for these things, naturally, um, you're instincted to say, well, clearly they are trying to push the vaccine as the holy grail and the only answer to this problem. And that then begs the question, well, why why is that? Why is the vaccine the be all and end all and the only thing that the, the established powers want to push? I don't know. I mean, the um, I, so I like you try not to get into the kind of, you know, like in, in, in my life, I try and look at logic and reason. And my goal, you know, in the business I run in the business I run now, uh, I spend a lot of time looking at data and I have my my team look at data every day to try and look at how we solve problems. That's what we do. <laughs> so <laughs> my goal is kind of like trying not to indulge myself too much in big conspiracy theories um, and try and just kind of peel back the curtain, see what's and kind of see what's going on, really. Um and I think that the, my lesson in the last 20 months has been to examine things bef- very carefully um, before I take a view, if that makes sense. Um, you know, so when someone says something like, example, um, you know, 99% of everyone in hospital is currently unvaccinated. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so um, my question would simply be, and that might very well be true, um, but let's look at the data because what we do know is that the the way that um, you know this, the last twenty months has been a, an incredible masterclass in how is in how to lie with statistics. Um, you know, there's, and there's so many examples of that happening uh, in, in major you know major media outlets. Um, you know, graphs with weird axes and like you know where they only show part of the year and you know all kinds of crazy things have been going on. So I think that's what I you know I think that's what I generally speaking when I'm having polite conversations with people about the stuff, I'm sort of just like you should probably just look at the data because the answers are all there for you. And you can see exactly what, if you take 20 minutes to have a look at it, you can see exactly what's going on. And it actually requires very little narrative. Um, and the thing about it is in the UK, um, we have really good data on what's been going on. In fact, the ONS produces really, really good data um, and very up to date. Um, and that is unlike a lot of other countries. Um, so it's really, really clear to see what's going on where and, and how and everything else. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is just to get people to look at the data and make up their own minds, really. You're right. And one of the problems is exactly like you say, there are these statistical games that are being played. And I think my fear is the latest one we're about to see is that now that all of the people who have been double jabbed are about to be put back into the unvaccinated category as the yeah. booster becomes necessary to be uh, to qualify as vaccinated. My uh, fear is that all of these people who have had two jabs will now be considered unvaccinated. And then once again, we will see figures of, ah, 90%, 95% of people in hospital are unvaccinated. But what that will actually mean is they haven't taken the latest booster. And then we have an ongoing cycle where it will be actually impossible to tell uh, how many yeah. people uh, are unvaccinated because my definition of unvaccinated is you haven't taken any of the jabs. But now that that's no longer going to be the case, um, it's going to be very, very difficult. That The data will be completely muddied. I mean, I think that's true. And I think that one of the curious things is that it does seem to be quite a strong um, emphasis on elimination of the control group, um, which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, and I, and I think that is actually, that might be at the heart, I mean, apart from obviously money, which is clearly a big driver for a lot of the stuff that's been going on for the last 20 months. Um, I do think a, a logical, um, explanation here is elimination of the control group. Um, so, uh, because if you eliminate the control group, um, or any, any potential side effects, <clears throat> um, just become part of background noise effectively. Um, and it's impossible to know whether people would have, or would have not had this or that and everything else. So I do think that's a reasonable explanation for the, for the big kind of emphasis and drive towards the stuff. That's probably what, that's probably what I would be doing. I'd be like, let's eliminate that pesky control group because that's just going to get, get us into trouble down the line. Yeah, Definitely. And uh, on that note of money, um, let's turn to that for a minute because something that I think is so crazy and to me it seems very, very obvious that we should be outraged by it, but it just seems to be an accepted norm now, is the idea that these vaccine companies essentially are having their product not only pushed by governments and people being coerced to take these products, 
but they are being almost, um, well, in, in some countries, they will be completely mandated. Now, I can't think of any other corporation or any other industry that has their product forced in such a way. I mean, even in some of these countries which are going to mandate a vaccine, I don't even think they mandate that children, for instance, go to state schools, uh, let alone <laughs> a private organization, a private company, um, which now they will have to take the product from that company. It seems to me that this is an inc- like incredibly dangerous territory. I'm just interested to get your thoughts on that. I mean, <clears throat> I think that... Um, the, I, I think the, the, the thing that I think is important is allowing people to make decisions for themselves based on uh, available data. Um, and most importantly, this thing called informed consent, um, which we seem to have kind of uh, knocked to one side, which I think is a bit curious. <laughs> so um, I think that I think that's really uh, problematic legally and problematic morally as well, and deeply unethical, of course. Um, how uh, Big Pharma has managed to sort of persuade governments that the that, that, that some of these products should be quote unquote mandatory in certain places, I do not know how you pull those levers of power <coughs> personally. Um, I think there's a lot of money probably being spent on lobbying, which probably really helps for sure. Um, and um, you know, this, the, I think that money, you know, we know this is no secret. We know from looking at what's been going on in our societies for decades and decades um, that money has got a really incredible ability to corrupt people. Um, you know, and um, I think sometimes we like to pretend that corruption is something that only happens in developing economies, um, but it doesn't. It happens right under our noses. It's just probably for larger amounts of money. Yeah. And with regards to informed consent as well, I think that the idea that these same people who are pushing this vaccine extremely hard are claiming that there is informed consent and they're saying, hey, well, you don't have to take the vaccine. We're not forcing you. It's just that if you don't take it, you know, you've got to quarantine for 10 days when you return. You've got to take more tests. You've got to pay all this money for, um, you know, various tests. You can't do these jobs or those other jobs. And this seems to me to be a complete bastardization of the word consent because if you applied those same things to something else if you said okay well someone um is going to use these kind of ultimatums for something like you know you you have to uh, have sex with me otherwise you um i will do this or you can't do that we would accept completely and we always have accepted that that is not a consensual process and it seems Absolutely. to me that um and i know some people will say oh well you know um sex and, and vaccines they're they're completely different but i'm not questioning the item that is being coerced what i'm questioning is whether the word consent applies to both so it doesn't really matter the, the thing that you're applying yeah. it's whether that word consent is applicable i mean we, we've kind of just changed the definition and the meaning of things and i just think that this is something we're not talking about much which is that going forward um, we're now going to have to grapple with different definitions of the word consent, which are yeah. because we've allowed for something to be called consensual, which clearly is not. And we would never have um, determined that that was a consensual thing before. Yeah. And I think the most fascinating example of that actually is, and I don't, you know, I, I think the abortion issue is a really complex one. Um, but the most startling example of that is exactly the kind of like Planned Parenthood, my body, my choice situation. Um uh, which is talking about bodily, you know, the fundamental right to bodily autonomy. So I choose what goes in or out of my body. Um, you know, I have the right, if I'm a woman, to have a child that I don't want aborted, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so it does seem that we've got ourselves in a bit of a pickle um, where on one hand we're saying my body, my choice. On the other hand, we're saying you must have this injection or else. Um, and I think that's, you know, quite a dichotomy. Let's put it that way. And where are those people? Where, where are all of the my body, my choice people? It seems to me that they should be on this side of the, of the argument. And I, I don't see where they are. You know, where, where are the, the human rights people? Where are the progressives? It, they seem completely absent from this. And that is a real curiosity. I mean, um, someone like Jenin Youngs, who's the that lawyer in, um, is, a, is sort of a, what is she, a criminal rights, but rights lawyer in, criminal rights, uh, criminal uh, lawyer in New York, who's doing a lot of work on this. And, and that's kind of the, what she's been saying. Um, and she's sort of like, where are, like, where are the ACLU? Like, where are Amnesty? You know, where are all these human rights organizations when we're talking about this stuff? And they are bizarrely absent. <laughs> um, I don't really know why. I think that's that a curiosity. Um, and I think it's, I think part of it 
is because, you know, politics in America is so incredibly polarized. Um, so you're basically either a Democrat or you're a Republican, right? Um, so, and there's a very funny Saturday Night Live sketch um, that came out a couple of days ago, I think. That is the, um, and a few people commented that it was the funniest thing they've seen in a while from Saturday Night Live, where they've been really off the boil for a while. Uh, and it's basically like, how do you know whether you've got a Republican? How, how do you know whether someone's a Republican or not? Um, and it's pretty confusing these days, right? Um, so on one hand, you've got kind of, you know, the, and I, it, it's very confusing. And I think that, um, and we're going to see this in the midterms, I suspect, in the US, into, you know, next year. Um, I think you've got a lot of progressives, uh, you know, Democrats, effectively, who are in a real pickle right now. Um, so they're really confused <laughs> because they're like, my body, my choice, got to get, got to get a jab, basically. Um, you know, and I think that is a very confusing position. And I think that that position will collapse in the end. You know, in the end, I think we know that the truth bubbles up to the surface. Um, and if you look at the recent um, governor race in Virginia, I think it was Virginia. Um, and, um, you know, that was won, won by a very progressive Republican governor, right? fascinating isn't it <laughs> so uh, you know i do think in terms of you know that that stuff has really been dictated by u.s politics i think i think that's why i've ended up in that sort of weird weird kind of position yeah yeah um sticking with the theme of politics for a moment um we didn't really go into your reasons for um moving to lisbon is there a story behind that um so i was in london at the time running and i finished up running another company in london um and um i was wanted to live in lisbon and i thought it would be fun to try um and also i wanted to i was kind of very upset when the uk left the eu i guess i thought that was a bit of a ridiculous move uh, although i now maybe have reversed that decision um and i was kind of like okay so i moved to lisbon a place i really love um where hopefully the weather is warmer and the covid stuff will be less you know there'll be less covid restrictions which was kind of kind, kind of true um and also at the same time pick up a kind of portuguese residency so that's the main that's the main reason really and then i ended up doing a startup here which is one of the companies i'm i'm working i'm running at the moment so and we're based we're based in lisbon and then another office in in, in the states yeah, so let's talk about the EU for a minute because I'm in a very similar position. I voted Remain at the time and I was very disheartened that we decided to leave. Yes, me too. But since that point, um, and I would say in particular over the past kind of 18 months, I have changed my mind on it. And I think if it came to a vote again, I would probably I would probably vote leave, but I don't think that it would be... It wouldn't be with a huge amount of strength. I think that there, I can see the... Um, strengths and weaknesses of uh, being in and being out. However, I think that I, res I, I certainly respect the reasons for leaving a lot more, and I actually yeah. give them a lot of weight now. In particular, well, before I go into my reasons, I let's let's find out um, from you actually. Um, what were your reasons for um, changing your mind about that um, recently? And um, I think that this is, and this is really a competition about like sort of sovereignty and control, right? Um, and I think that the, the ideas of the European Union, I mean, the European Union debatably um, has prevented any major wars happening in this part of the world since World War II. So in that case, it's done a, a tremendous job if you really, if you really think about it. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been peaceful, it's been liberal, you've been able to live wherever you want. Um, and there's lots of really great things about the, the EU. Um, on the other hand, you've got this big parliament in Brussels, you've got all this kind of bureaucracy, you know, and all this other kind of stuff going on as well, which is certainly not ideal. Um, so my reasons. Um, so originally, yes, yeah, so originally I would have remote to remain because I would have said, well, I want to be able to travel easily. Being, being part of the EU feels kind of nice. Um, you know, something, and, and kind of it's not doing any harm, I guess. Like why change, why is, if it's not broken, don't fix it, something on those lines. Um, having said that, I think witnessing <laughs> what we have done in the last kind of 20 months leads me to a different uh, conclusion um, that actually leaving was probably the right decision. Um, but I, if it was me, I would have been communicating the reasons for leaving in a far more effective way than, were, than it actually were done. So I think communicating it as a money saving trick was completely uh, you know, nonsense, basically. And we should have been talking about sovereignty um, <clears throat> and talking about. Um, 
um, the problems with the EU and talking about the economic disparity, sharing currency, sharing interest rates, and all of the problems that are associated with this kind of where, where you have multiple economies sharing the same currency and the same interest rates, which I think is really problematic. Um, you know, so that's that's the way I would have focused the communication more. Um, and that actually makes me think a little bit like a little bit about our friend Donald Trump. Um, who I think had a lot of pretty good ideas, um, but was actually a really bad communicator. Um, and I think that, that's, that was a huge problem for him. Um, so for me personally, I hope he doesn't run again. I think that's the wrong, that, that'll certainly be the wrong decision. Um, but he had some good ideas that were not communicated very, very well. And he was very bad at choosing the team around him. Um, so it was quite interesting. Yeah, I'm glad that I gave the floor to you on that one because you pretty much echoed exactly my thoughts about EU I have I, I can't really even add to that much um I completely agree I think that I think that sovereignty is um the key issue it wasn't talked about much we were talking too much about how much money it was going to save etc rather than saying hey this actually is an opportunity for us to regain sovereignty for it you know I don't even remember the word localization being used or localism being used, but I'm a big fan of localism. And, you know, the interesting thing is you've got people from the political left and the political right who all care about localism and community, et cetera. Um, but these words weren't really used at all. And actually, if I was to to do the Vote Leave campaign, I mean, I can't necessarily knock it because at the end of the day, Leave won. But I will yes. be talking much more about um, localized democracy and things like this and, and um, yeah. sovereignty on a, on a national level which I think are really, really important things. So, um, well, I guess I did have something to add, but... Um. No, no, I think that's exactly right. And we didn't have any of those conversations. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that is, a, that is a general theme where somehow politicians believe that people are stupid. Um, so they don't want to have honest, thoughtful conversations, town halls, debates, um, you know, which they should be doing. And, and people aren't stupid. If you give people information uh, and you talk to them nicely and kindly, um, they will be thoughtful. Um, and you might learn something. Um, so, and, you know, I think that one thing is certainly true is that we've just seen leaders and leaders, quote unquote, um, just ride roughshod over any idea of talking to you about what they actually feel or want or what their needs are, uh, what their desires are, how they want to live their lives. Um, and I think that's a huge error. Yeah. And I, I think that we're not alone in this. I think that there's a lot of people who probably would share our views I certainly notice people who I communicate with on Twitter who are saying similar things that actually, you know, the media likes to present this idea, I think, that most people now would vote Remain, that we all made a terrible mistake. And if you did the vote again, you know, all these old people who voted Brexit have died off now. Now we would all decide to vote Remain. I actually think you would get um, quite a landslide for Leave if you were to run it again. I think a lot of people... Um, heard these stories of you know how everything was going to come crumbling down if we left the EU etc and actually now many of those people are looking at EU thinking wow like I'm glad I'm not part of uh, this political union yeah what a disaster yeah <laughs> absolutely um, you know but there are some really good things about the EU as well I mean just uh, like a really really tiny example um, so my uh, ex-partner um, was actually a Moroccan national um, and we were trying to get her uh, a visa for the UK, which was actually incredibly difficult and very, very expensive. Um, now, doing that um, for the EU um, is much easier because there are some rights enshrined um, which are very easy to execute. Um, so, and there's even an, even a team um, that are obviously paid for by the European Union, um, whose job it is to respond to weird immigration problems um, that I have to say were incredibly diligent and kind and helpful when we had a problem, um, and um, came back to us with tw within 24 hours with a solution, which is quite remarkable. Imagine getting an answer out of the Home Office in the UK within 24 hours that way you could take action. I mean, that's almost unheard of. Um, so there are things like that, you know. And for example, I'm a big believer in high-speed rail and kind of those kind of other methods of transportation and i think what you know again you know the eu's done a, a pretty good job um at dishing out cash to deal with kind of like high-speed rail projects in particular uh, you know in particular places um i didn't even on the high a bit on the high-speed trains in spain but they're absolutely brilliant i mean um you know the french have been doing it for a while <laughs> but the spanish have built an incredible rail network in a very short period of time um and um you know really almost eliminated the need for internal air in, in spain 
Um, so that's pretty cool, I would say. And I think we need, you know, more kind of, I actually really like big infrastructure projects when they're, when they're done well. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, that's one of the things the EU, I think, does reasonably well, could of course be better, but does reasonably well. Um, and I think, for example, in the US, you know, th there is very little high speed rail, barely any, in fact, um, which is a huge problem. And they could actually, they, they should have, you know, in my opinion, the, the 1.2 trillion, whatever they've just passed for the infrastructure bill, you know, if it was me, I would have been spending the vast majority of that money on building a very comprehensive high speed rail network in the US. Sure. I think that's probably an area we're going to disagree because, in my view, when it comes to Europe, um, a lot of these costs are actually hidden from the consumer. So, you know, we see European countries that are in quite a lot of debt and quite often these infrastructure projects, they are subsidized heavily by either the EU, the national government itself, or through the um, taxpayer. Um, yeah. You know, j just in terms of, you know, you, you pay for, so for instance, in France, it's quite cheap to get these train tickets, but a lot of it is paid for through taxes, not through, yeah. uh, not via your actual purchasing yeah, of the it, ticket. It, 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 the, the pricing isn't transparent. I agree with you on that. I mean, the you'd have to really do some maths to work it out. I mean, I think, I don't, honestly, I don't know whether these things pay for, pay for themselves in the end, if that makes sense. Um, but by the same token, I also don't know whether roads do either, if that, may, if that kind of follows. Um, it's not a dissimilar problem. Yeah, I, and, with, and with regards to the, the US, I mean, with it being such a big country and the states are, you know, sometimes you've got states that are, you know, the size of European nations. Yeah. Um, it it would be very difficult to have the all of the main US cities connected by rail. I'm not sure whether that would necessarily translate. Don't know. I haven't looked. I haven't looked at it personally, but I think it would be a fascinating. I mean, you know, for, for all of my criticisms of um, uh, China and everything that's been going on there for the last little while, uh, they've been incredibly efficient at building an enormous high-speed rail network. Um, and, yeah. I'm, and I remember being in uh, Nanjing and Shanghai 15 years ago, and I was there twice in a year. And the the gap that I was there, they would built two metro lines in Nanjing like two metro lines in nine months, which is quite, and got them, and got them live, which is quite remarkable. Sure, yeah. Um, on, let's go into that a little, because um, I got the impression um, from kind of our interactions on Twitter that you were more on the libertarian side. Where, where would you kind of position yourself politically? I think I am more on the libertarian side. Um, but I also think that there are some things which I regard as kind of like important national infrastructure, for example, um, like airports to roads and railways. Um, and um, but for example, on the on the healthcare side, I think that there is a good argument for um, I mean, the NHS is really a disaster um, and needs to be kind of reformed root and branch. And a lot of people who work in the NHS would say that as well. Um, and again, I don't know what this don't know what the solution looks like necessarily. Um, uh, I mean, <clears throat> my back of a fag packet on it is that I like the idea of a kind of like compulsory insurance system um, where if you can afford to, you pay and you choose to plan and blah blah blah. Um, and if you can't, that the government pays um, for a basic level of cover for you. Um, and I think something like that can be a way of doing it. And I think some Scandinavian countries do something similar to that. I think. Um, so there are, but there are no easy solutions to this stuff. I mean, um, I, I'm quite a big fan of like of Ronald Reagan, who I think did a great job when he was running the US. <laughs> um, and he really believed in small government. Um, and when he was running California and the governor of California, um, he gave, you know, they gave money back to people. They, they, they had a surplus, they gave money back to people and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think generally the philosophy is the government should be pretty small where it can be. Let's not have millions of people employed by the government for no particular reason. Um, but I think there are some things which I take the view of as being national infrastructure, um, where it becomes economically unfeasible for a private company to do something, if that makes sense. Um, and a great example of that, again, is, for example, the railways in the UK, where we flip flopped from privatization to public to private to public. And now you've got a, a, you know, a nightmare in the middle where you've got you know, rolling stock owned by so and so. This is a, a private public partnership. I mean, God, I mean, the, the, you know, the amount of times you've changed it is nauseous. Um, so uh, I think there are some, you know, there are some good arguments to be made for having national infrastructure. Um, and I think there should be taxation. I'm not anti-taxation, um, but I think there needs to be a, a huge amount more transparency about where that money gets spent. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to the NHS, 
because I agree that the NHS is not fit for purpose. And I guess I don't really have solid data to back this up. It's not like my opinion is formulated from, you know, looking at lots of different data and comparing it to lots of different healthcare systems. Although I guess it's it's more on a personal experience of it. You know, I feel that I've had times when I've been failed by the NHS. I've had friends who've been failed by the NHS. I've had family who've been failed by the NHS. And it seems to me that you're just not allowed to criticize this institution. And one of the things which I think is starting to happen now is that people are finally starting to speak up a little bit about this. But what do you make of the kind of NHS worship in the UK? I think that <laughs> worshipping anything is kind of a bit of a peculiar fetish, I, I would say. <laughs> um, and I think that healthcare systems are should be designed to serve the people, not the other way around. Um, <laughs> and um, I think that's a failure of communication to not be able to communicate that effectively. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't cherish things, and there's a difference between worship and cherishing. Um, but I think we've got it the wrong way around with, certainly with the NHS, <clears throat> where, you know, we're meant to do everything to save, quote unquote, save the NHS. Um, I mean, the NHS is designed to save us. Um, we pay taxes for that reason. So I think that's certainly the wrong way around. Yeah. And a prime example of that is recently, I don't know if you saw uh, Sajid Javid. Yes. I, and, I, and, and that crazy tweet where he said you should have some more respect or something. Yeah, he basically, yeah. someone was, um, you know, just to, to go over what happened, someone tweeted um, tweeted at Sajid Javid and said, um, why is it that I've had my two previous jabs, which were Moderna or something, and the third one, I'm only being offered Pfizer, I can't get the Moderna. And his answer yeah. was, so what, you should respect the NHS, which I thought was unbelievably telling. I thought that was a real pivotal moment where it was almost like a peek behind the curtain of how these government ministers really view things, um, because they just think that they have built up such a cult around the NHS that they can get away with saying things like this to the taxpayer and that everyone will just say, oh, yeah, you should never you should never criticize the NHS. And it seems to be a, a really kind of watershed moment from my point of view. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I saw, and Julia um, was right on that, wasn't she? Do you remember? She was, she actually, I think she retweeted that. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that it's not, you know, it's not a sacred cow, it's a health service. <laughs> um, and we should have been, what should have been happening over the last 20 months, is we should have been re-engineering this health service to serve our needs better. Um, and again, I think this is just inexcusable. And this is all about this sort of the correct and proportionate public health response to a major crisis. Um, and I think we've just got so many things wrong here um, uh, that, could, that were easily foreseen and, you know, could have been avoided, basically. Um, you know, it's literally like we, we have learned absolutely nothing. Yeah, and I think it's difficult to overstate, really, just what a paradigm shift this is, because we now have a situation where you're saying, OK, we all have to do our part to save the NHS, which is an institution we pay for. I mean, mm. imagine if we did that for something else. Let's take, for instance, the police service. Imagine saying, well, we've got to have lockdowns because the police service, um, you know, there's more robberies committed at night when it's dark. So imagine them saying, we've all got to stay at home to protect the police service because there's too many robberies happening. People would be rightfully outraged and they would say, well, wait a second, the police service is there to serve us. You can't lock up the citizens to protect the police service. But I actually could imagine that happening now because we have had a shift in philosophy as a society whereby we're all supposed to serve our public institutions rather than the other way around. And this seems to have just kind of happened and gone relatively un unnoticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is really a pivot towards kind of socialism at the end of the day. I mean, and that you have to, I think we should just call that what it is. Yeah. Um, it's this sort of idea that, you know, as a um, the, the society as a collective is more important than the individual in some kind of way, um, which I think is a, an interesting notion. I mean, I think that, you know, and, and um, it's also fascinating to see that coming through uh, on, in, in, you know, in stage. Uh, what was that? I can't remember the woman's name who's on stage. She was sort of basically a sort of a, a well-known communist. Susan Mitchie. 
Susan Mitchie, <laughs> absolutely. Now I've got no problem with Susan having whatever view she wants, um, but I'm not sure there's a place for, um, you know, a sort of a communist attack when it comes to emergency response. I don't know how that helpful that really is to, to public health. I wouldn't have said um, if that's not helpful at all in my view. Um, so, you know, health systems have to be there to serve the people at the end of the day. And our job um, is to, as intelligent people, is to re-engineer what we have to make it better fit, you know, better suited for purpose. So I would have been retooling the NHS, um, thinking about what we do in the event of a disaster, um, thinking about people that have, you know, staff that have left the NHS and why they'd left, um, you know, and just, you know, thinking about all of those, you know, how do we prepare for winter better? Every year there's a, there's a crisis in the NHS in the winter, how do we do that better? And um, how do we deal with the root cause of chronic disease? So, you know, how do we really deal with that? What does that look like? Um, you know, how do we try and deal with obesity and, and, and type 2 diabetes and metabolic health? have those difficult conversations. Um, but also those interventions made early, you know, are very cheap compared to, to, to dealing with the consequences later. And I think that's what people don't really understand. Um, dealing with someone before they get heart disease, uh, you know, way before, a decade before, is much cheaper than dealing with them when they are, you know, in, in the operating theatre or in A&E, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And um, I... I wish that these conversations were actually happening. I Unfortunately, I don't have much optimism that these kind of very common sense conversations that we're having right now are actually happening in the kind of um, corridors of power. They're not. <laughs> and, and I think this is also one of the, you know, one of the things that we've seen in the last 20 months is the kind of um, this concept of kind of civil, civil society where we can discuss and debate. Um, no one gets too offended. We can disagree politely. You know, this is really the fabric, in my view, the fabric of, of humanity in many ways. And this is what makes us different to, different to animals and to baboons is our ability to disagree and not, and not want to, you know, hit each other with an axe or whatever, or chop some arms in little pieces. Um, you know, it's able to disagree politely, uh, debate, discuss, um, you know, and everything else. And I think that that is so important, um, you know, and, um, <clears throat> you know, the idea that we should be censoring people's opinions and calling them dangerous or misinformation um, is a really uh, scary strategy for me. Um, because, you know, some of, some of that quote unquote misinformation could be something that saves your life. You, you never know. Um, so I think we have to be really careful when we start censoring civil society, um, which is what we've been doing for the last 20 months. Yeah. And my worry is that we are um, moving more in that direction rather than the other way. Although I do think that recently there seems to have been a shift. I've definitely felt more positive in the past couple of months. It seems to me like people finally are allowed to speak up against things like um, being anti-lockdown, about um, being against uh, mask wearing, about being against uh, vaccination of children and some of these other controversial is issues, which now seem to be much less controversial. So I am starting to see uh, some signs of hope there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, again, it's like, I, I think that um, the, prob the problem with Twitter, which I've really enjoyed using in the last couple of years, um, and I never, I, I had the account for ages and never really used it before all the COVID stuff started. The problem is you only have a very short amount of time to get across a message. So, this, so the nuance can often be missed, right, which is a huge issue. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these issues to do with should you or should you not vaccinate children, um, do mask work or not, and et cetera, et cetera, are, are sort of become big issues that are worthy of considerable conversation and dialogue and evidence to be presented. Um, and Twitter has a tendency to shorten that debate, uh, you know, and make it about, you know, you know, you're an idiot, I'm an idiot, and blah, 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 <laughs> rather than what we should be doing, which is presenting the evidence um, and saying, is there good evidence, you know, based on the precautionary principle that we should be doing X, Y, or Z? Um, you know, is there good evidence? I mean, let's just talk about lockdowns quickly. Um, is there good evidence that lockdowns have any, you know, what is what is the goal of a lockdown, A? And then B, when you understand what the goals are, is there evidence that it actually achieves those goals? Um, and how do we measure that? And I think this, these are the conversations, these are the sort of intelligent conversations we need to be having. Um, and then we then we have to look at the, the, the data and the evidence. And based on that, we can decide whether these interventions were incredibly helpful or incredibly harmful. Um, you know, and that is, that is what we need to be doing. 
Yeah, I mean, on that topic, though, when it comes to lockdowns, my belief on this is actually quite different from that. I think that in terms of lockdowns, we should be, it doesn't necessarily matter to me whether a lockdown is going to be um, effective or really even how effective it's going to be, because I think there's a philosophical question here, which is a conversation that we're not having, which is, is it right to lock down innocent people, healthy people, etc.? In the case of coronavirus, you're locking down healthy people um, in order to, you know, su- supposedly say, save lives. Although, you know, most I think med- many people would would say that we're not actually saving lives. But again, to to go back to the analogy of, sh- would it be right to have a lockdown in order to prevent crime? Um, yeah. To me, even if you could prove through data, okay, if you have a lockdown, um, you're going to prevent this many robberies and this many uh, murders and this many rapes by locking down and everyone has to stay at home between, uh, you know, there's a national curfew permanently between um, nighttime hours. I think that we should still say that it's wrong, despite how many lives it's going to save or how much crime it's going to prevent, because there is a fundamental and philosophical issue, which is that we we're here to live free as humans. And this is something which I think is a conversation that we're not having. Yeah. And that, that need, that conversation needs to occur as well. Yeah. And I think that there is, and this is, this is the philosophical argument, which is that we are free to do as we want. We shouldn't harm others, but I can live my life and you can live yours. And we can do that in whatever, whatever way we want, which is, which I think is absolutely right. we should be having that conversation. Um, so I, in my, uh, one of my last businesses, I was involved in running uh, venues in London where we had late licenses. Um, and one of the arguments we used a number of times to get a late license through till seven or eight in the morning um, <coughs> was actually the, if you boot everyone out of a venue, if you boot a thousand people out of a venue at 4 a.m. in the middle of their evening, um, you actually create chaos on the streets. In fact, that's exactly what happens. Um, everyone leaves at once, everyone's in the middle of having a great time, and you have chaos, and you have bottles, you have um, you know, a ruckus basically outside. Um, so um, and one of the standing arguments that, that other people use as well is this argument that, you know, and it is, this is exactly what happens. When you allow a closing time for six or seven in the morning, what happens is people egress by themselves um, very nicely and orderly uh, when they're ready to finish their evening. And they get a taxi home, they take a bus, they get on the tube or whatever else. <laughs> so, you know, and we know that by examining what actually happens when you kick a thousand people out of a venue at four in the morning, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I, I agree with you philosophically, um, I, I, but I also think on the bright side, if you looked at the evidence, for example, for um, you know lockdowns based on crime profiles, I think you would probably find in the end um, that you shifted the crime from being a robbery to being domestic abuse or some other kind of horrible thing that would happen somewhere else, I would, I would probably expect. Um, and, and for, to look at that, we can just look at the uh, numbers of kind of domestic abuse cases and child abuse that was reported during the coronavirus lockdowns, which went through the roof, basically, because you have people that are normally able to go out to the pub or go and play darts or go, you know, let off steam in a variety of ways, uh, cooped up at home um, with their families. And of course, this is completely abominable and terrible, um, but that is exact. But we created that situation without really looking at the evidence in terms of what the consequences might be. Sure. I mean, from my point of view, even if you could absolutely quantify with no um, margin of error that, for instance, more people were going to be saved from crime, for instance, by doing these things, or more Mm. um, lives were going to be saved in some instances, I still think that I'm a fundamentalist when it comes to freedom. I think that there is a, a line at which we should not go below and that we shouldn't try to sanitize society in every single respect because actually what you do is you end up flushing uh, the life and the vibrancy out of human existence. I completely agree with you and I think the first, I think this is a, you know it's, a, it's an absolutely important point. <laughs> um, for me I, I'm, all, I'm just about making things I wouldn't about recommending things. So for example, you know um, we have a very uh, you know you know, a deadly pathogen that's going around. Um, it particularly impacts on um, old people, um, you know, the vulnerable and blah, blah, blah. And we strongly, strongly recommend to you that you stay at home while we figure out what the hell is going on. So that to me is good public policy, right? Um, it's not making you do something, it's giving uh, evidence and information um, and recommending people take a particular course of action. 
Um, and, and I find for me that more much more palatable than the you must do something. Um, and I think that's generally speaking quite an ineffective strategy when dealing with people. Totally. All right. So let's start to round this off. So I guess going forward, what are the things that we can all be doing um, to try to live life to the fullest and to try to, um, you know, remain sane during these times? And do you see uh, some positivity? Do you think that things are looking like they're going to improve? Uh, do you think that things are getting worse? Like, where, where do you see the next few kind of months Let's start the crystal ball moment. <laughs> so I think we're seeing some scary stuff happening in a few different places. Um, Australia, Canada, Austria, uh, Germany, places like that. <laughs> um, but what we know from history is that um, it kind of get, it often gets worse before it gets better in some respects, right? Um, and what we're witnessing is really the <clears throat> kind of the death, the la- in my view, the last kind of desperate throes of a regime um, that will collapse under its own weight, um, at some point, um, and it might be in a few months, it might be in six months, it might be in a year. I don't think it will carry on that much longer than that, I wouldn't have said. So I think that's what we're going to see. Um, I think that, um, I think, I, I actually think that the shining lights out of this in the end are going to be England, uh, and maybe also uh, the, you know, the rest of the UK, if we can get them out of their slumber a bit, um, and also the US. Um, and I think the US is very much awake in terms of what's going on now. Um, we're seeing major pushback across the board. Um, you know, and I do think that for people that are, you know, for example, you know, people that would um, lay, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to label someone as an anti-vaxxer or, you know, all this, all, all this, kind of, this kind of rhetoric, very, very easy. But I think those people that might seek to use that kind of terminology um, should really examine what's been going on here um, and really look at um, history and say, you know, what are the, pa- you know, I think uh, Neil Oliver, um, who I'm a big fan of, you know, the Coast Guy, I'm a big fan of, Love uh, said, said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I think that's incredibly accurate. Um, you know, this isn't repeat of the Weimar Republic, um, but there certainly are some consistencies with what's been going on here. So I would encourage people that, you know, might say, oh, you know, those guys, they, you know, they're just, they're just anti-vaxxers, quote unquote. Um, have a look at what's been going on and the trend lines and look at the rhyming that's been happening and see whether you think it's okay for you. Um, because, you know, these... Um, I think that it's quite clear that what's been going on isn't just about, uh, you know, public health and it isn't about a virus or a disease. And it hasn't been probably for quite some time. Um, And I think when we realise that, um, then it becomes uh, much easier uh, to look at it with a kind of an objective lens and kind of see a little bit in terms of what's been going on uh, and do so in a way which isn't uh, dramatic, um, that isn't, uh, you know, very kind of bombastic, that isn't violent, um, but is calm and measured and considered. And when we do that, we have the ability to take others with us on that journey. Great. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, do you want to just let people know where they can find you as well? Sure. You can find me on Twitter um, at Jordan120. There we go. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.